and a follow-up, Don? Uh, yeah, when, uh, Premier, are you going to rename Alberta Health Services, uh, Alberta Hospital Services? Are you actually going to do that? I mean, you won't have to change the letterhead too much. I contemplated that, but I have been told it would be a very expensive rebranding exercise, uh, especially when you think about how many facilities they operate, how many business cards and letterhead. I would rather see those dollars go to improving frontline care. So I just want um, people to know our framework for um, the reforms that we're doing is to really get AHS focused on delivering hospital care, surgical care, emergency care to the very best of their ability. Thanks, Don. Operator, could you put through our next caller, please? Or could I, Premier, or, can I, please? In regard to Don's prayer. Yeah. yeah. Next question. The yeah, line of before, yeah, just in, if I could, if I could say something in regard to to Don's uh, question about a lack of accountability in that report, um, I have to tell you the easiest thing for any panel to do is look at the last person to touch the ball and say, "Let's throw him under the bus or her under the bus." Uh, there was a uh, inspectors who, for years, have taken on the philosophy, public health inspectors, that it's about education and it's about getting compliance. And they go out there and a lot of them do a really good job doing that. Most of them are hugely committed to it. It's about doing an inspection, getting voluntary compliance and, and, and prevention. In this case, we learn that, that, that the, that the um, offenses, the violations they found, they followed up on, the violations were corrected in a reasonable time. Could it have been done, or for, but done better from the perspective of the parents should have been made available? Absolutely. But when you look at the thousands of inspections that followed the same philosophy about let's, in, let's go in there, let's inspect, let's fix what's, what's uh, if it's not a, fix it and prevent, then it, it's, it's not fair that when there's a huge a backlash, a bad outcome that occurs, that we go to the last person who touched the file and then hold that person responsible. That's why we looked well beyond the simple solutions to, to what else uh, should be done to address the issue. So um, I just felt that it, I had to answer that particular piece of the equation. Uh, so I'd, people didn't think that somehow there was negligence on the part of, of the inspector and not taking the steps forward. That led our, to our recommendations to include changing legislation so that if you believe somebody is overtly or somebody's creating a, uh, is a chronic offender, then the, there's a clear path to the charge, the way the person's to be charged, what the fine is gonna be, whether it's a court appearance and getting that person into court. Currently, that's not there, where it's clear, and, that current, and, and in the future, um, that's what these recommendations are about, is changing that piece so that there is other options available to holding people accountable. Perfect, thanks, Rick. Operator, could you put through the next caller now, which I believe is Kelly Kreiderman? Kelly Kreiderman, your line is now open for the question. Here, or the minister, you talk about addressing these issues in, in future, but should parents be concerned that we don't have a timeline on when the changes will be made? You're talking about consultation, you're talking about the need for legislation. What can concerned parents look forward to even this fall in terms of action on this file one year away from, as you said, this, this crisis? Well, I would say that some is, is, is going to be implemented right away, and I'll get uh, both the ministers to talk to that. The, the issues that, uh, that Chair Hansen just brought up about having consequences and investigatory powers built into legislation that, that requires a legislative change. You can't just implement that. There has to be a process that you go through and you know how our legislative process works. We'll have to see if we have the ability to draft something up for implementation this fall or if it would have to be in the spring. Um, and then there's also the other question of what kind of additional training do we need to give for uh, food being brought from home? And Minister Jones talked about that. We'll have to do some consultation on that because uh, when somebody sends a brown bag lunch with their child, is uh, that going to have the same level of food handling practice requirements as somebody cooking in a commercial kitchen? We, we have to be nuanced about this. We don't wanna create a bunch of additional 
rules on certain types of, of actions if it's, um, if it's unwarranted. Uh, we, we absolutely want to implement the commercial kitchen, but we have to sort of figure out from, uh, from parents and from daycare operators what they think the appropriate level of, of training, awareness, permitting, accountability would be when we bring in outside food from, from parents packing a lunch for their kids. So that's why it's sort of in three different uh, phases. One phase we can implement right away, one that will require legislation, hopefully this fall, but perhaps in the spring. And then the last piece that will require some consultation just to make sure that uh, where we already know that we have a, a, a you know, regulatory requirements um, uh, on our operators. We want to make sure that we're implementing these policies in a way that, it, that isn't overly burdensome and achieves the goal that we want. Let me get to Minister LaGrange to talk about those different phases from her perspective and then Minister Jones. Thank you, Premier. And I think Premier did a great job of saying that that's exactly it. We're analyzing the recommendations. We are starting to put them in, in the buckets that they belong in, immediate, moderate, medium, and long term. And um, as we continue to move forward, uh, we will absolutely implement those that we can immediately. Um, we've already mentioned some, including the, um, the process pieces of having the um, most recent inspection put on a door um, that a parent can see very quickly. I also want to remind everyone that the recommendations recommendations while you know they were around child care centers they have broader implications for the whole system and we want to create a culture of food safety for the whole system because it's not lost on us that this could have happened in a senior's home this could have happened in a school so we have to really look at all of the broader implications and how uh, we can improve uh, food safety throughout the whole health care system minister jones yeah, I would just add that the, the ultimate success of these um, uh, improvements, these recommendations, these reforms is going to be in collaboration and compliance. Uh, we can have the strictest measures and legislation in the world, and if there isn't that culture of food safety, uh, you're still going to have the, the, the potential for foodborne illness and outbreaks uh, because of people disregarding those high standards and that legislation. So I think it's critical that we implement everything we can immediately that we can. Uh, while those things that require collaboration and consultation, we take the time to work with our partners, both in the food side and, and the child care side, uh, to implement them in a way that they will buy in. We need buy in to a culture of food safety. And so we're going to involve those who have to buy in in that process. Thank you. Thank you. And did you have a follow up, Kelly? Yes, this is for the Premier. Given the importance of uh, the province's agriculture industry and its beef industry, are you concerned that we still don't know the source of this E. coli strain? And will you ask agriculture to speed up that investigation? Well, I've been watching how um, there have been a, a number of uh, cases where uninspected meat was found to have been served in private facilities. And I've watched how uh, the different investigation arms have worked together on that. I, I think um, well, we do continue have to investigate how widespread that is and, uh, and, and make sure that we're, uh, we're, we're, that our laws are in sync so that there is also some accountability around that. I can maybe turn it over to, to, uh, to uh, Chair Hansen and he'll tell you a little bit more about how they uh, integrated with, uh, with agriculture when they discovered that, the, that that may be one of the aspects that they had to look at. Yeah, we and, and uh, it was really gratifying to hear how already there's um, efforts being made to integrate how investigations are now conducted in the province. Our SMP livestock folks, uh, the Alberta Ag folks, uh, and others who are now working more closely together to really uh, target the um, the, per the perpetrators. There's people out there that do this on a regular basis. And I can tell you one thing that was really gratifying, again, from our perspective, is that um, the, the livestock producers in this province are incredible. I heard that from RCMP livestock investigators. I've heard it from others. And they were hugely supportive of providing information when they could, when they got knowledge of some of these illegal avatars that were operating in any proximity to, the, to their farms and ranches. So 
it's the genesis of a really good system is there. It's not like there's there was criminal neglect occurring in all parts of the food safety chain on a daily basis. But what there was was individuals who were trying to take advantage of the gaps that existed. And if there's one thing that, and I, and I know it sounds corny, but it made me proud <laughs> to be an Albertan was when I saw what one, one rancher did, the lengths he went to, to obtain really usable information that was actionable by those enforcement agencies that uh, had to take his information and take it forward into a prosecution. It was really gratifying. So was that a concern we looked at? Absolutely, but I can tell you that the, the food safety, the folks involved in the food safety chain, especially the producers, the farmers and ranchers, hugely cooperative and hugely um, engaged in anything that can be done to, to make their product a safer product uh, when it gets into the, into the global market. Thank you. We have time for one more quick question. Operator, could you put through our next caller, please? Hello. Can we put through our next caller, please? One more question. Our next question is from the line of Terry Reith from CBC News. Terry, please go ahead. Yes, hi, good afternoon, and uh, thank you so much for taking my question. First, uh, for Dr. McDougall, what are the chances of a uh, strain of DNA sharing the same fingerprint uh, as the one found in the E. coli and the one found in the, uh, in, in the uh, uninspected meat? What are the chances of those occurring naturally, uh, or, or is there a good case to link those? Thanks for that uh, great question. There's a, a system that exists in Alberta and across the whole country that does that DNA testing of E. coli and looks for any similar pattern that could have happened in other provinces in previous years and even into the United States. And there are very, very few E. coli um, isolates that have had that same genetic fingerprint as the ones that were uh, detected here. There were five from another province, also in that same year. And other than that, I think there was one several years ago from a state in the United States. So the likelihood of this happening randomly and not having a connection of some kind is pretty remote. Right. And did you have a follow-up, Terry? Yes, I sure do. Uh, and uh, back to uh, Mr. Hansen, we uh, and and any others who want to weigh in, we know that uninspected meat is making it into businesses. How will the province uh, beef up its rules to better protect consumers on this front? Well, we'll take the advice of uh, of Chair Hansen as we go through this. Um, but it does seem to me that we already have, uh, based on uh, what, um, what he discovered during the investigations, we already do have an investigation team within agriculture. I think perhaps the solution is to do, if we find other instances like this, the, the same kind of cross-ministry collaboration where we would be able to do some surveillance and be able to get the health uh, 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 inspectors to give the information that they have and then ensure that we're sending in agriculture to do the full investigation. I think that's what I'm hearing from this report is that um, the uh, bring, bringing an operator into compliance has been the mandate and approach with Alberta Health Services as they've been going through analyzing all of the food uh, safety practices at all of the different establishments that they that they oversee. However, if something steps over the line into where it needing a prosecution, that's a piece that we need to build, and we'll, we'll build those connections with what we already have as a starting point. But I, I suspect what you'll see is that agriculture will continue to play a larger role, and we'll have um, more integration between the inspectors and agriculture if something does rise to that level that there needs to be an, an investigation. All right. And with that, that's all the time we have for questions today. Thank Excellent. you, everybody, Thanks, for joining us. Thank you. Thank you again.